All right, and we're back. We are in chapter 16.1, and this is going to cover pages 510 to 515, and the chapter is called War Erupts. This image here on the inset is a depiction of the attack or bombardment on Fort Sumter in the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina, which kicks off the Civil War in the United States. So our learning objectives for today, I will identify the North's strategy for defeating the Confederacy, and I will explain how the Civil War began. So this is a cool picture up here from Lookout Mountain in Tennessee, looking down on the Tennessee River, and that is Chattanooga, the city of Chattanooga down there. Cool pic. All right. So we're going to be spending the next couple of days talking about the actual events of the Civil War, a lot of the battles and the bloodshed and stuff. So it's important before we do this to get this kind of idea to our head of how deadly the Civil War was. So this graph over here, on this axis, this has all of the major wars ever in American history from the Revolution all the way down to Iraq and Afghanistan. And this bar represents how many people died in these wars. So if you notice, this bar is way longer than everybody else. That is the Civil War. And in fact, more Americans died in the Civil War than all other American wars combined. And more recent estimations of this number right here put it over 700,000. So this is a major event in American history. It cost the lives of a lot of people, and it, it created from its ashes a new country. So let's take a look at the beginning of this war. So a little bit of review first. What we know is that Abraham Lincoln won the election of 1860. He beat John Bell and Stephen Douglas and John C. Breckinridge in a crowded field. And in December of 1860, southern states began to secede or quit the Union of the United States. By Lincoln's inauguration on March 4th, that should say 1861, seven states had already seceded. So South Carolina left, and they were followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and then finally Texas. So that's seven states out of the Union by the time Lincoln actually is sworn in as president. So when this happens, any forts, army forts that were in these southern states that have seceded, they now fall under the control of the Confederacy. So one of these forts was called Fort Sumter, and it's a small fort on an island in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. This is it today or, or currently. You can go there and take a, you can take a ferry boat over there and check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so that was still guarded. That's, that fort, even though it's in South Carolina, which had seceded, it was the first state to secede, it is still guarded by a garrison or group of federal troops. Federal troops are guys from the north. We call them the north or the union or federal troops. But they were running out of supplies. So Lincoln, who's the president, he must make a decision. He's either going to need to send supplies to the fort so these people can keep it together on this garrison duty, or he's going to need to surrender it to the Confederacy. Remember, the Confederacy is another name for the Confederate States of America. and is the nation that was formed by the southern states as they seceded. So Lincoln informed the Confederacy that he decided to resupply the troops that were stationed there. He knew that this action might provoke or encourage the Confederacy to launch an attack on Fort Sumter. But guess what? He does it anyway. Confederate leaders decide to attack the fort before it can be resupplied by the North. So on April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter is attacked by the Confederates and the Union garrison, those northern troops that were on Fort Sumter, they surrender after about 34 hours. So Lincoln, it's important to know, Lincoln was looking for the South to fire the first shot. That would look better for him. That would give them some type of like a moral high ground in this if they did not fire the first shot, especially since they were dealing with an enemy that was much smaller than they were. South was convinced or maybe tricked or something into uh, firing the first shot of the Civil War. There's a video right here about Fort Sumter, a few minutes long. I want you to take a look at that. So we are now gearing up for a full-scale war after Fort Sumter. So we need to talk about how these two sides, the Union or the North and the Confederacy or the South, are going to prepare for the battle. So after Fort Sumter, Lincoln decides to ask the Union for 75,000 militiamen to serve for only 90 days to put down what he calls an uprising or rebellion. 75,000 is not a very, very big number. And he's also militiamen he's talking about, not the professional army. These are volunteer fighters that just kind of are collected from towns and villages, and they might have their own weapons and things like that. So poorly trained, poorly equipped most of the time. 
you remember from the Revolutionary War, George Washington didn't think too highly of militiamen. So it's a fighting force, but it's not ideal. So uh, this shows that the Union, because they had these guys only sign up for 90 days, the Union believed this war would be really, really short. So in the Confederacy, things were changing too. So after Fort Sumter, four more states joined the Confederacy. Those states were Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Adding Virginia was in incredibly important for the Confederacy. And we're going to talk about why. So here's a better look at the map at this time after those Additional four states seceded from the Union, bringing it up to 11 total. This is the CSA, or Confederate States of America, or the Confederacy. And up here is the Union. So why was Virginia so important? Why was the Confederacy so excited and so determined to get Virginia to join? Well, for a few reasons. One was that it was the most populous of the seceding states, meaning that it had the largest population of the other seceding states. Okay, It was also wel wealthier than the others. Virginia also had more industrial facilities than the other Confederate states. That meant that they were able to produce uh, uh, weapons and ordnance, which is cannons and ammo. This is a place called the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia. It's the site of where they made cannons and cannonballs and all types of stuff for the Confederacy. Another reason why it was important for Virginia to be part of the Confederacy was that it had great symbolic value because many important events from the Revolution took place in Virginia. And indeed, a lot of these people who were fighting for the South or the Confederacy in this war view their struggle and their fight as an extension or maybe a second revolution. So the capital of the Confederate States of America was moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. So it's a cool video about the ironworks right here. I want you to check that out. All right, Robert E. Lee of Virginia. We're going to be hearing a lot about him in the next few days. So he was a military officer who served in the Mexican-American War. A lot of these guys who were figures in the Civil War were young men fighting in the Civil War. We see that happen a lot throughout history. He was married to George Washington's adopted great-granddaughter. He was asked by Abraham Lincoln to lead the federal armed forces in the Civil War, and he was actually considering it. But when Virginia seceded for the Union, Lee resigned from the Army and joined the Confederates. He said that he could not fight against his own people. By that statement, he realized that by his own people, he doesn't mean Americans, he just means Virginians, people from Virginians. And he goes on to become one of the greatest military leaders of all time. Border states. Let's talk about border states right now. If you look at the map over here on the right, this is page 513 from your book, and the border states are colored in blue. So simply what a border state was, it was a slave state or a state that allowed slavery that remained in the Union. They did not secede and become part of the Confederacy. So they were Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. West Virginia will they'll come into existence during this war. It will break off from the rest of Virginia. Border states were very important for both sides. The resources and waterways in border states helped both sides in this conflict. So here's the strategy for the Confederacy. So Confederacy has to be created because they have some really, really big things working against it that are not in their favor. So the population of the Confederacy was much smaller than the Union. The Union has 22 million people. Confederacy has nine. And of those nine million people, four million of them are slaves who are definitely not going to be able to fight against this invading Union army because people are not going to arm slaves in the South. They'd be worried about a slave revolt or an armed uprising or something like that. So really, there are only 5 million people who would be eligible to fight for the Confederacy, then take off the number of women that live in the Confederacy because they're not going to be fighting here, and you realize that the numbers are stacked against the Confederacy almost from the beginning. Another big problem for the Confederacy, the North has 22,000 miles of railroads and the South only has 9,000. North has lots of widespread industry and factories that they can produce the instruments that you need to carry out a big war like this, while the South is mainly agricultural. So the Confederacy needs help. So they, can, they, they count on getting assistance in multiple ways from Britain and France because those two countries depended on the cotton grown in the South. And the Confederacy strategy was to mainly stay on the defense, meaning they would let the army come to them. That's a very, very smart move considering their situation. And their military leaders had to be creative and daring to overcome the odds. So this is the Union strategy. How are they going to put the, uh, bring the bring the Confederacy to its knees? So they called it the Anaconda Plan. This was developed by a guy named General Winfield Scott, who was in the Mexican-American War. But by this time, he's too heavy to even mount a horse, so he's not going to be an important figure in this war, except maybe for this plan right 
right now. So like an anaconda, the Union would choke out the Confederacy, first by blockading the forts. That means they do not allow imports and exports to come and go from the south, which cripples the economy. They wanted to get control. Part of the Anaconda Plan was to control the Mississippi River right here, which would cut the Confederacy into two. I mean, it would have all this area on one side, and on this side would just have Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. And then lastly, they wanted to capture Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. So before we start looking at some of these battles, you may notice when you study some of these battles that oftentimes they have two different names. So, for example, the first major battle of the war was fought near the town of Manassas, Virginia. And that battle is known as Bull Run to some and Manassas to others. And a little over a year later, the bloodiest single day of the war was fought near Sharpsburg, Maryland. That battle can be called Sharpsburg or more commonly Antietam. This has about a minute long video explaining how that comes to be that some of these battles have two different names. It's pretty interesting and it's very brief. And you're going to need to know that. All right. So the first battle was in Manassas, Virginia in July 1861. Many people in the north were eager for a quick victory over the Confederacy. So following the Anaconda Plan, a quick attack on the Confederate capital of Richmond was seen as a quick way to end the war, but it wasn't going to be that easy. First, the Confederate troops at, Man at Manassas would have to be defeated. So most soldiers on both sides lacked experience. The Union Army might have been overconfident and think they would have trouble with the rebels. And here's something crazy about this. This picture looks kind of out of place when you're talking about a bloody battle, but residents of Washington, D.C. actually traveled to watch the battle, and some even brought picnics to snack on while watching what they thought would be an easy Union victory. It was not an easy Union victory after all. So here are your generals for this battle. Irvin McDowell leads the Union, and the Confederates are led by Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard, PGT Beauregard, a.k.a. the Creole. So the Union Army had some success at first, and they drove the Confederates back. But then General Thomas Stonewall Jackson, who was with the Confederates, he holds an important hill, and his soldiers stop the advance of the Union. The Confederates launch a counterattack, and the Union Army runs away in terror. The battle, is a, the battle is a big victory for the Confederates. There is a picture of Thomas Stonewall Jackson that is on the field at Manassas right there. That's a big statue of him. That's about, I'd say, about 30 feet tall or something. So here are some of the results or the lessons of Bull, uh, Bull Run. So around 5,000 casualties, which was just terribly, unthinkably deadly for that time, the Union was totally surprised by the results of the battle. The Union was also embarrassed. Many teased the Federal Army because they had left the field so quickly and in such a disorganized way. They called Bull Run the great skedaddle, like, get out of here. So people realized that the war would not be short or bloodless, and it said it would take a long time and many would die, and Lincoln calls up for a half a million soldiers to sign up for three years. All right, that's it. See you soon.